we won't do it because I don't want to introduce any chemical to someone who doesn't want that chemical in their body. So we will not do it. A lot of people do it because it adds shelf life um, and it makes it pretty. So for the adulteration at the supermarket, when does that actual process take place? The producer who produces fish for them, because none of the supermarkets produce their own product. Um, so it's the, on the producers and correct. the board shipped. It would, be a, it would be a processor who's producing, let's say, haddock fillets or whatever. So would the people at the supermarket behind the fish counter know whether? Probably not. So how, would, so how do you know as a consumer? It's tough. The FDA allows certain information uh, to be <coughs> published uh, and labeled on the container that they sell it to. But then once the retailer takes it out of the container and puts it in the showcase, it no longer has to be labeled. Like these fillets may say uh, contains, and then there's a chemical name, but there's, there's several what I would call a citric sort of based preservatives, there's sodium tripolyphosphate, so there's a whole bunch of things that they use. On this container it has to say it, but the minute the retailer pulls it out, puts it in the case, all bets are off. They don't have to. And it's more prevalent than scallops. Scallop is the one is the one item besides the fillets that you can do a couple of things with. You can adulterate them by adding water. You, and also a preservative, typically sodium tripolyphosphate. The FDA says uh, that you, a, a scallop out of the shell, you take a scallop, which is basically abductor muscle from a shell, you take that scallop meat, if you measured the water content of that scallop, which you can do, the scallop is actually about 22% water or moisture at that point, sometimes 20, right around there. The FDA will allow you to go up to 29.9999% of water added before you have to state that it's water added. So therefore, the scallops you buy in a certain supermarket that's across the bridge, um, <laughs> those scallops, even though you don't know it, have sodium tripolyphosphate added or citric, and they have been water added, but they by law do not have to say so. Which is a shame because the minute you take that scallop and put it in the pan, water leaches out and you kind of go, how'd my scallops get so soupy? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's become an issue, but if you come to Harbor Fish, that will never happen because we will not do it, uh, period. That's why, if, if you think about this, if you, add, if you were able to add 20% weight to anything that you sell, and let's say your boat lands 20,000 pounds of scallops and this distributor processor gets them. You add 20% to that times $14 a pound, let's say. That processor just made 40, 50 grand extra because of the extra weight. So it, it's a very profitable thing for these guys to do. Um, and I like to talk about this because consumers, for the most part, have no clue this is going on. How do dry scallops? I didn't a dry scallop is exactly that. It's never been soaked. It's never had so it's 20, 22 percent. Yeah, it's natural coming out of the water, right out of the water. In fact, we buy scallops. I bought a load yesterday um, here in Portland at the auction, and uh, for me, I you know I'll, I'll take scallops and eat them raw. I'll just have to taste a few, and you know, uh, you know the boat didn't touch them. We know that, uh, and then we don't. We take them out of it. They come in a bag. Looks like a to you, it looked like a big sort of burlap bag. It's like linen almost. And we, we uh, basically take them and we pull out any possible shells. We go through them, size them, because they're different sizes. Put them in a gallon, that's it. Other deals will put them in a vat with the size of, uh, the size of your bathtub. Soak them, 24 hours, chemicals, drain them, pack them, off they go to the supermarket that will remain unnamed. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so those are some of the common practices. It happens with hams. As a matter of fact, if you look at a ham, you know it says 25% water added. Uh, because they've added more than 25%, they have to state it. If they were less than that, they wouldn't have to. So this is an FDA, an FDA thing. So. 
All right, so storage of your, well, let me, uh, whatever you want to do your things. So storage, all right, I'm going to buy some haddock fillets on Friday. I'm not serving them until Sunday. What do I do? You know, do I take them in that package that you wrapped and throw them in the fridge? That's good, right? They've been kept cold? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. You know, want to take them out of the package, put them in something like plastic, a Ziploc bag. Uh, Ziploc bag's the best. Take a bowl like that, put that package in there and surround it with ice cubes in the fridge. That'll last twice as long as if you took that package and stuck it in the fridge. Dry refrigeration will kill almost anything. If you took a package of crab meat today, just pick today, put it in the fridge, just throw it on the shelf, tomorrow it's probably no good. But if you take it, Ziploc bag, same thing, ice cubes, lobster meat, I don't care what it is, ice cubes, you'll get three to four days, no problem. And we also tell people, if you're ever, ever going to, and you're buying product and you say, hey, look, I'm not eating this for three days, is this okay? Our staff says, nah, why don't you try something else? Or, you know, yeah, it's nice, it's good if you can cook it tonight maybe or tomorrow night, but, you know, three, four days, you might want to go over here or over there. So don't be afraid to ask those questions if you've got, you know, those sorts of concerns. We don't mind asking that. Now, same thing with lobsters. Um, sort of a different category. How do I keep them alive? I mean, I've had more stories over the years. I filled up my bathtub oh. and I put them in. They died. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I want my money back. Oh, jeez. You know, I can't tell you how many times you've heard of those sort of stories. And you guys are local, you know. You take lobsters, you don't put them in water, you just keep them cold. That's all they need. You put them in a pool with ice, make sure that they're not sitting in the bottom with the water melting and they drown, you know. So lobsters are sort of a different issue, but cold. That's the lobsters only need cold. Refrigerate, crisper door, best. Stick them in there, close the door. They like that. I'm very happy. Like my dogs, they like to be under the blankets, you know. <laughs> Same sort of thing. Uh, if you need to freeze something, um, you know, our home freezers aren't glass freezers. So it's not like that great freezer you buy some frozen fish sometimes can be very good if you get the right get the right process. Um, I tell people to, if you're gonna freeze like a whitefish, a haddock or a flounder or a sole, small batches. You know, don't try to freeze something like this in your own freezer. A little batch, add a little bit of salted water, a little brine, a little bit in the bag, and put it in there. And don't keep it much more than a couple of weeks. After that, the fish is very delicate. The, the, the structure of the fish is very delicate. And, and, and it just does not like to be frozen for a long period of time. Unless you have a blast freezer where you can <coughs> it, they have you know water coated and all this sort of stuff that'll keep it longer. So short period of time, small quantities. If you're gonna freeze like a crab meat or a lobster, I tell people actually add a little bit of milk to the lobster meat in the bag and then freeze it. That moisture will help it so it doesn't dry out because lobster can get very dry, you know, can get you know rocky. So Questions on storage? Or, um, that's smart. What about seaweed with the lobster? Well, seaweed helps. Wet newspapers help. You know, lobsters like moisture and they like cold. Think about it. They live at the bottom of the ocean where it's, you know, 48 degrees and it's wet. So that's kind of what they like. So they're happy with seaweed, wet newspaper, um, anything that keeps moisture around their bodies will, will, will make them happy. So. All right, the big subject, wild versus farmed. Um, let's see, where do we begin? Um, 25 years ago, I think, was the first time I remember um, that they stopped fishing for Atlantic salmon. It was illegal to commercially fish. It might have been 30 years ago. You can't fish for uh, Atlantic salmon anymore because they're an endangered species. In the old days, we'd, we'd drive up to Newfoundland or Halifax and load up with Atlantic salmon, drive them back, 4th of July, here you go. No longer. Those days are gone. So people said, okay, salmon are one of the few things that farm or grow easily from a smolt, a tiny little egg, baby. Um, so that industry was sort of born um, because the wild salmon industry fell apart. 
So some people were real smart and they figured it out and they said, okay, how do we do this? And when they first did it, it was a learning curve. It's like anything else. Um, they said, we're going to put them in pens in the water. So if you've ever, I don't know how many have ever seen it or understand how that's done or that process is done. Um, but let me talk about the process and then we'll talk about is it good, bad, or otherwise. Um, the process is that they have these huge pens. They would look like one of those nice backyard swimming pools that people have, above ground swimming pools, except maybe five times as big. Round, um, they have a bottom. Uh, they, they sit above the water by about that much. Um, and they put the smolts in there and they salmon swim in their own environment. And you can, if you go up to Costco Bay, up Blueback, Eastport, and those sort of things, you'll see them up there. Machias Port, you can see them. And they're big pens out in the water, and they have to be fed. Now, in the early days, they just fed them whatever. You know, what will salmon eat? You know, salmon will eat other small fish. Um, you know, they are omnivores, so they will eat other live things. Um, then they had to figure out, if we're going to feed them, how do we keep them red? Um, so we get food dye? Yeah, what do, how do we do that? And then they had to say, after a few disasters, they get sick when they're in those pens. One will get disease, and it's like anywhere else. That disease will pass. The next thing you know, you get 10,000 salmon that just died from a disease. So they had to figure all this out. In the meantime, as all this information <coughs> gets disseminated and passed out to the public, the public is saying, oh my god, I'm eating red food dye, uh, I'm eating a diseased salmon, uh, they're contaminating the environment because, if you picture this big pen with salmon swimming around, they eat, they poop, and it all goes to the ocean floor. So you would see this big ring on the ocean floor that virtually died because of all the salmon droppings. So environmentally, in the beginning, uh, and over the course of time, people were saying, I'm not eating farm salmon. It's bad for the environment, it's bad for me, and I could understand where those thoughts came from. But humans are smart, so they said, okay, how do we fix this? So what they said is, we're going to come up with a, quote, medicine that is not an antibiotic that will feed the salmon in their feed that keeps this disease from eradicating the entire pen. We will take the pens and we'll move them every week around so that they're not killing the bottom underneath the pen. We don't need to give them red food dye. We can do it in another way through natural uh, feed that they have developed that is, uh, in some cases, vegetarian. They, they come up with all kinds of ways to do this, to keep the salmon red. Because what happens in captivity, a salmon will get pale in the meat. And of course, a pale salmon meat is very unappealing. You want a nice bright red salmon, as we all do. So, what has happened? For example, one salmon we sell is a Scottish salmon from a company called Wester's Ross. Uh, and I'll just read you kind of what they write in their little blurb. Uh, it says, all natural Wester Ross is raised with no antibiotics, no growth promoters, no GMOs. It's slowly hand reared on organic fish meal produced from trimmings of fish destined for human consumption. Which means, let's say I'm filleting these pollock and I get little trimmings off the edge because we do, they take all of that, all of that food, all of that stuff and make food out of it. They, uh, they clean their nets where they dry them in the sun, they move their pens around. Uh, they have done everything, I think, that over the course of the last 25 years has made me feel like I have a problem with that product at all. None. Uh, there's nothing in there that, let me put it this way. If I was to go eat a steak or that salmon, I guarantee you that steak has a lot more added product to that cow than that salmon I've ever had it to hit. It's not even a contest anymore. So. The learning curve has sort of really come full circle, and the way I look at it now, salmon in particular, because we don't sell a lot of tilapia or
catfish or there's really no other farmed quote farmed fish that we sell around here that people care about. It's mostly salmon. Now I will say that there are some producers, mainly the country chili, that still feeds their salmon meat byproducts. Uh, because Argentina and Chile produce a lot of cattle, they have byproducts from those cattle. That protein will make those salmon grow three times faster. And if you're in the salmon growing business, you can produce three times more salmon in a year than the guy who's not giving them protein like that. You're a winner. So the Chileans, for example, we won't sell Chilean salmon, uh, use meat byproducts to make their stuff grow that fast. So just be aware. We sell, for example, we sell Wester's Ross Scottish, we sell a Faroe Island salmon which has the same practices, and we have a company here in Maine, the same sort of practices. So we stick with those three. We feel very good about you taking them on and feeling comfortable about what's going on in the body. So, um, Nick, does the salmon, uh, with all the farms, is the is flavor pretty consistent or is it very flavorful? It's interesting. Um, if, it's funny, that, that would have been a fun thing to do. Um, if you were to take those three salmon and cook them the same way on a plate and, and close your eyes and try to tell the difference, I think you would say, yeah, this one's, I like this one better than the other one. I think you would, you would recognize which one tasted better. Nine out of ten times, it's either the Scottish or the Faroe Island. I think have a slightly better flavor than the main. So can you ask when you go in where they Oh, they're all, from? they're all right, right there. Right up there. Okay. Faroe Island, Scottish, Maine. Yeah, they're right there. It's no, no mystery. Okay. We don't cover it up. We'll tell you what it is. So yeah, it's there. Yeah, and I, I tell, you know, I take home, I mostly take home Faroe Island. Um, and I love the Scottish too. Uh, I take that home. Maine, not as much. That's just my preference. But. Some people like the idea that it's a farm in Maine. They want to support local and that too. You know, we support the company. Um, so if, if somebody is just going to say, this is more to cross the bridge, yeah. it, would their, their far, farm raised salmon, would they not be able to speak to that kind of quality that you have? Uh, I think in the case of salmon, I think they do a good job there. They are handling, the main salmon I'm referring to is a company called True North. Um, they're out of Machias Port, and they're owned by the Connors Brothers, one of the real big producers. They also handle True North. So their salmon, I'm sure, is, is, is good. The only thing with, that I often get nervous about with the supermarket is they warehouse stuff. You know, it's going to a central warehouse somewhere, and there's a security on there. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, yeah, I think it's another step in the timing. Sure. And, you know, but I think salmon is not getting adulterated there. It's, I think the salmon are okay. Yeah. yeah. I noticed they did stop carrying Chilean salmon. They used to. Yeah. Um, okay, another question around farmed salmon and farming that has become a hot topic. Um, you have to feed salmon. And one of the issues has been, are we robbing the ocean of another fish to feed the salmon? In other words, menhaden, herring, you know, there's a whole fishery geared to just catching that stuff and <coughs> feed out of it. So there's real controversy around, you know, do we, do, we, do we support that? Because now all of a sudden it's the food chains getting, or the, I shouldn't say the food chain, the fish chain in the, in the ocean is sort of getting disrupted because we're catching so many menhaden. And there is now talk about, and, and this is all science, I mean, this is science stuff, but it, it's, it's a topic. Um, right now that they're catching huge amounts of haddock, but the haddock only this big. We can't find haddock that big anymore. They're finding huge biomasses of small haddock. So we've been asking the question, why aren't they growing? You know, where, where are they? And the speculation is that they don't have enough feed to grow and they're dying. So these biomasses, they're so big, these masses of haddock, hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish in one biomass, can't get enough feed. And what they used to feed on was probably menhaden, you know, all small, and, and that stuff's being caught to feed salmon. Thank you. So 
you know, so there's a real discussion around what do we do? Well, again, we're smart humans. Um, we're the salmon farmers have figured out a way to use seaweed products now to feed salmon. So some of them have gone to kelp, and some of them have gone to uh, uh, agricultural stuff uh, to make salmon and do, you know, and doing away with some of the protein that is necessary to make foods. They may grow slower, but they are, um, they're not impacting the environment as heavily. So I, I, I guess where I'm leading to, and I said I hope I convince you that wild stuff is okay, um, is that it keeps evolving. This whole farming keeps evolving. And I look at it as such an important piece because if there was no farm fish, no farm salmon, catfish, tilapia, etc., the prices of wild fish, the haddock, the cods, and everything else would be so high, none of us could afford it. Because salmon, for us, it's interesting, last week we were looking at some numbers. Haddock was always the biggest, quote, fish by volume that we sold every week. Salmon surpassed it last week for the first time. Fillets of salmon surpassed haddock. And we were kind of looking at it going, I never thought I would see the day. But it happened. Now, if we didn't have those farm salmon, I guarantee you, you'd be paying $20 a pound for half. And be kind of going, I don't know about that one. So, so for me, it's a necessary, it's a necessary food source for the world. And I think it continues to evolve and it continues to um, be better for us. Um, so I quote and one that promotes it as opposed to saying, I want nothing but wild. Well, wild's good. We've got it. It's about twice the price, but we've got it if you want it. Um, but I never discourage anyone from wild uh, farm raising anymore. We weren't allowed to catch it anymore. Wild. Uh, wild salmon is only caught on the West Coast. Okay. No, there's no Atlantic salmon okay. fishery that is wild anymore. None anywhere in the world. The only salmon that are caught wild are West Coast king salmon or Chinooks, sockeye salmon, and silver salmon, or chunks, we call them. Those are basically the three kinds of salmon that are wild caught. Been, and they have very short seasons, typically through the summer. We're just starting to see it now. We're, we're getting our first sockeyes and kings, uh, and they go in spurts. They open areas, close areas. The West Coast is a whole different animal in the way they manage their fisheries. Never understood it. They open it up for three days, 9,000 boats go and they catch a million, you know, three million pounds, then they close it. And it's like, well, now what? <laughs> they, they, they do a strange thing out there, but that's the only place you can get wild salmon. Well, I may that's have a it. stupid question, but what's the difference between the salmon and the steelhead trout that looks almost exactly like it? In well, a steelhead, a steelhead is basically a trout is a, a sea run trout, which is slightly different than a salmon. It's a different breed. And they are farming those now, too. Yeah. Um, it, it would almost appear to be the same. I mean, physically, they're, they're shorter, stouter-looking animals. They have a, a more red on the outside uh, in appearance. Um, good fish. Um, but they, they've got a slightly trout, you know, that slightly trout flavor to them. Yeah. To me, it doesn't sound. Once I've started cooking it. You like it? Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, that's nice to hear. Help yourselves to more mushrooms if you want. Yeah. They're delicious. Mm, they are so good. Not my recipe. <laughs> are there other fish right now that are close to being extinct? Or yeah, let's talk. We'll talk about sustainability. I want to get into that. I got one more thing to talk about: wild versus farm. You know, there's wild caught fish, which is basically all your brown fish, your haddock, your cod, your hakes, although they are, they've tried to farm cod out of Canada in several attempts, not done well. Um, they tried to farm all of it too, not done well. They struggled with it, they just couldn't live in that environment. Um, but all of those fish are basically caught wild. Swordfish, um, you know, they can get into your big fish, your swords, your tunas, your mako sharks, that sort of stuff. All that stuff's wild caught, harvested, it has to be hunted. They have to hunt it. They've got to go looking for it to catch it. Where a farm, they obviously don't control the environment. Then there's a whole other range of products that we call managed. Most of that is shellfish. So we call them farm, farm grazed mussels. They're really not. Um, they are, they're not. The difference to me is a salmon is in its natural environment, but it is fed. We have to feed them. We 
because they're not out in the wild to be able to forage for their own food. Uh, mussels, uh, oysters, uh, some certain clams are what we call a managed resource. In other words, they take a seed, uh, whatever it is. In the case of oysters, by the way, there's only two kinds of seeds in the world. Um, one is the, the Japanese one, the Kumamoto seed, and then the other one is the American oyster seed. And that seed is the only seed that you will ever see on the East Coast that is grown, but yet it produces a myriad of different oysters because that one seed depends on where it is grown, where it lives, as to what it tastes like, the shell, how it changes, the moisture content, the salinity, all of that changes, but there's only two seeds in the world, that's it, all the oysters there are. So, in what we see most often, I actually brought some with quite a little bit of you. Um, so, manage resource. Uh, the so, the oysters are grown in a myriad of different ways, some in like baskets on the bottom of the, of the river, um, some are grown, basically they just, seeds are just sort of strewn about and they live in a leased, they lease these areas from the state. This area is mine, I pay so much for it, and I plant, plant, plant my oysters there. So there are different ways of doing oysters, like mussels, there are different ways of doing those. Some are bottom grown, some are grown actually on a rope, the rope grown mussels. Um, we have, the one we carry the most is Bangs Island mussels, where they have, um, and I've been on their raft, it's basically, if you've never seen one, it's pretty fascinating. It's a raft probably, oh, about the, eh, about the size, of, about half the size of this area right here. And what they are, they're ropes, and they actually take little seed, little tiny baby mussel seed, and they actually place them on these ropes. They actually take the rope, they place them, they drop them in. And in this case, it's managed because these mussels will now grow in their own environment. Find their own food, clinging, and the mussel clings to a rock, or that's what it does. So the mussel's clinging to the rope, it's catching nutrients as, as the tide comes in and out, it gets its own food, uh, and it grows, um, and, and it's, no one touches it, no one's feeding it until it's ready to be harvested. And they pull, they pull the rope up, they take the mussels off, clean them, bag them, sell them. So oysters, mussels, we call them a managed resource versus a wild. Now, a wild oyster would be one, there are a lot in Casco Bay, believe it or not, and they're mostly of the call, kind we call bellons, which is a very flat, uh, it's sort of a European oyster that sort of developed on its own, uh, and we keep trying them, they're terrible. They have a very metallic metal taste, and you kind of like, no. Um, that is a true wild oyster, they're just sort of out there, and I don't even know how they got started, but they're out there. But no one really sells them because they're not very good. Um, so the wild oyster might have been the one in Chesapeake Bay that hardly exists anymore. The old quote points. You know, they don't know, they don't they don't really they don't really, they don't really they don't have, they don't have a fishery, have a fishery on the Chesapeake, Bay. Chesapeake Bay. It's a mess. Too bad, too bad. So that's it. So that's wild, it. wild and managed, managed, managed are the are the quote three sources of seeds of sea beans that we sort of deal with. Deal with. No, no, there's a stain of building a building. I have a muscle question. Yeah, yeah. Is it okay to pick the muscles off of the rocks? Where? On where? The coast? Where? To Muscundus where? Bay? I would say yes. Say yes. As long as you are sure you're not in a red tide situation. Right. We have red tide. Yeah. We've had red tide periodically. Yeah, we have we've years. got a cask of air right now on muscles. So uh, if you're not in a red tide situation, I can't imagine why that would be a problem. But you have to soak them, I guess. I didn't soak my the sand out. Muscles should not have sand. Well, they had something. They had little pieces of rocks or something in there. They were not. Well, like, they can get pearly, sort of. Yeah. Yeah, muscles can get pearly, wild ones, and wild ones. Take them off the rocks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of that a lot happens. Of that happens you know, same, you know, same sort of thing happens with an oyster. If they get, if they get clumped together, together too much, too much, uh, you, see uh, you see big clumps of you, 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 you see muscles, yeah. you see yeah. big clumps. A lot of times, a lot of times it happens, it happens with oysters. The ones at the, the bottom, at the bottom can't, can't get can't enough food. They can't open their shell to 
uh, uh, gathering up gather the nutrients that are coming back and forth. Back and forth. So they actually so they form these, form these pearls inside the shell. Out of, out of, out of, out of, out of, it's almost like it's almost starving like them. Yeah, that's and kind of sure. Yeah. 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 I remember the old days. The old days. Yeah. 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 Um, just by very nature, a clam will open up, you know, to, to suck the nutrients through, and they get a lot of sand in there. You know, there's all kinds of wives' tales about how to clean a steamer, and none of them work except just rinse them as best you can and use your broth. Right. That's it. I mean, that's there's no other way. You can soak them, put vinegar in the water, you know, pray to the Lord. It doesn't work. None of it. So, <laughs> it's, it's the sand is there. Sorry. Oh, well, that's okay. No, but that's you're going to see that with that kind of muscle. So maybe I should just pick the muscle. On the top. Maybe try that. Not the crowded ones on the bottom. Yeah. And, and again, <laughs> these rope grown muscles, if you think about it, they're all along a rope dropping down 40, 50 feet. You know, so, you know, so they, 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 they don't have that, have that problem. problem. They're all able to get the nutrients from the water as that as that tide comes and goes, you know. And they try to put these rafts in an area with a with a current's pretty strong. Um, what ends up happening in that case is, for example, with the Bang Island guys, I've been talking to them where they grow their muscle, what ends up happening is their meat, quote, uh, to shell ratio is much higher than most every muscle. In other words, the, the, the shell is very thin and the meat is very plump. So that when you open up their weight, in other words, if you weighed a bag of their muscles and pulled the meats out, they'd, you'd have much more meat per pound than you would, let's say, a Prince I Edward Island mussel or some of the others that are out there. Um, and there are still wild mussels. We still have wild, quote, wild mussels that we sell too, that, that are coming from Lubeck. Same thing, they just wild harvest it off the rocks. They tumble them to clean them and send them down. Um, but we never have complaints of, of grit or anything else out of those, probably the areas they get them. Yeah. But we still have wild, quote, unmanaged. They were tasty, they were just Oh, I'm sure they were. Yeah, uh, uh, really. If you guys want to break it all, just let me know and we can take a... Yeah, we could take a break between sustainability if you want to. Well, then you can eat your mushrooms, too. They're very, they're very good. <laughs> is that recipe in the book? Yes, it is. Yeah, I like to, you know, talk. we'll talk about cooking things and, and about cookbooks and stuff. And I'm, I'd like to hear some of your I've got thoughts some around that. i people, too, if you want to shop at all. Oh, yeah, good. Where'd you get the crab meat? Um, there's this little fish store down the street, and I think it's called um, <laughs> Free Range. Oh, they're good. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm kidding. I don't know. Now, pine tree seafood, good? I don't know. Oh. Pine tree seafood? It's herbal. It's oh, it's on, it's on Route 1. It's on Route oh, one. I don't know. That's been they get their, yeah, they get their fish and I'm sure they are. It you know, good. but you can quiz them on stuff. You know, you know. He gave me a little oyster demonstration about how to look for really good well, oyster and what it means. To, so I thought he must know his oysters, and he seems to know. Well, that's good. His fish. Well, look, you know, he takes great pride in what he. Has. Well, that's important. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously it is. If 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 the guy knows what he's talking about, and and if you quiz him on, has this fish ever been adulterated or? Uh, the scallops totally dry, and if you ask those sort of questions, hopefully he's giving you an honest answer. And I didn't realize there was a scallop season. Oh yeah. I had no idea. Well, there's an inshore season and an offshore season. Oh. The inshore season, uh, or a Casco Bay season, and that sort of thing, really starts around, um, oh my god, I think it was December 1st this year, and ended April 15th, something like that. And, and it was extended a little bit. It year? was no, it was shut down early. Oh, early. Yeah, so sort of like the main shrimp season. Oh, they just that's it, done. Yeah, and that's good. You know, they're watching how many pounds are landed. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, we'll talk about talk but about there's still an offshore season. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And what and what around scallops? Scallops are scallops landed, scallops are landed, are landed very in several areas. Several areas. Canada, Canada, has huge, huge, huge scallops. Scallop Bedford, Bedford, Massachusetts, Massachusetts is the number one scholar in the world. Excuse me, country, country. Japan, 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 Japan,
till there, 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 till there
what you have. You yeah. know, it's, you know, you're not, you're not going to get any, 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 any stronger, you know, any more healthy, any more muscular, you know. No. <laughs> As I like to say, we've peaked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the peaks have come. And you, you won't get up somewhere between midnight and six in the morning. No. <laughs>
tell us about it. So let's go to the aforementioned Atlantic Cod. Right Okay. Okay. And this is the one that this I think most I people say, oh my God, there's no cod. This is the one that gets the most press, press. Um, um, I think. Um, um, and it's the one that is the most talked about, probably because it was the most abundant. abundant when this country was founded. Um, I think we all know those stories. Now, the reason I use NOAA is that they are, they have dedicated themselves to the science part of sustainability. They actually study. There's a guy at the Portland Fish Exchange every day making cod, and he takes a little pin bone out of the ear, and a little ear bone, and measures them, all of them, to see how fast they're growing, where they come from. There's a tag, a lot of them are tagged. They've got sonar tags on them so they can find them. Where are they migrating to? There's a whole science that NOAA does, so they study it. And I trust the science to some degree. The Monterey Bay Aquarium has no science. So, what they say about cod, although populations are well below target levels, and what they mean by that is they have developed targets to each species in each region. And let's say cod is 500,000 metric tons is a target they would like to see in the ocean. If it's below that, then it's below the target. But they also say U.S. wild caught Atlantic cod is still a smart seafood choice because it is sustainably managed under a rebuilding plan that allows limited harvest by U.S. fishermen. In other words, a boat can go out and you can catch all the pollock you want. Load up on pollock. There's pollock everywhere. Every day, 20,000 pollock, 400 cod. 20,000 pollock, 400 cod. And those are the kind of choices as a, as a buyer that I get. So we sell a lot of Pollock nowadays. But the thing is, we know there's cod out there. The fishermen tell us that there's cod out there. They say, oh my god, there are days I can't get away from I'm, I'm dropping my nets. I'm pulling up cod. And the sad part of it is a lot of it has to go overboard. They've kind of fixed how they do that. They can actually tell what the species are by the radar now. They've sort of found a way to identify it so they can get away from the cod and hit the pollock and the hake and the haddock. So they've done a good job with that. But the point is that they are measuring it. They know that each boat's allowed so much cod. And if, if that cod is being landed, it is regulated and don't be afraid to buy it. Now, the cod that you see in the stores now, 90% of the cod that you find in a store now, including ours, is coming from Iceland or Norway. They have developed a marvelous system of transporting that product from Reykjavik to Boston to me within a day. They've really got it down with science. Iceland Air is dedicated planes just to fly this stuff over uh, because it comes over in huge amounts. Now, Iceland and Norway sort of did a collaboration and they shut their fishery down virtually for almost 20 years because they were running into the same problems. And right now they have no quotas. They can openly fish for cod all they want, and the same for haddock to a degree. They have so much cod in their water that over 20 years they have now just rebounded hugely. And cod is somewhat resilient, and that's what's going to happen here. We're going to see cod come back. They're actually there. They're just not allowed to catch them. And they're continuing to let them build. That's what they did with Haddock, and now Haddock has reached a point, like I said, that they're starving to death because there's not enough food. There's so much Haddock, they, there's no food. There's not enough food to feed them. So it's sort of like a thinning of the herd. So they're catching all these small Haddock, and the government's allowing them to do it to try to thin the herd a little bit. So it's, it's, it's a science-based uh, It's a science -based thing. Uh, I'm, I'm just impressed with what they do. Now you ask, are there fish we shouldn't eat? There's a couple. We will not, as a company, sell, as you would call it, Chilean sea bass. Now, the Chilean sea bass is a Patagonia toothfish, is what it really is, uh, if you looked it up. And a Patagonia toothfish is one of the oldest fish in the water, and it takes them forever to, agree to reach an adult size. I mean, like 100 years. I mean, it's very slow growing. Slow growing. They're heavily black marketed 
product. They're caught off the coast of South America, the Pacific side. And you will see them in one well-known, quote, health food store here in town. Um, we still will not catch them. We won't do it. There was a political thing where they were, quote, MSC, which is another political organization. If you pay enough money, you can get that passed and cleared. Well, they did that with Patagonia toothfish or Chilean sea bass. But on my list, we don't sell it. We, not, we stopped selling mako shark for about 10 years because that was an endangered, quote, species. It has come off the list and is now okay. It just came off the list within the last six months. So we're probably going to start selling it. Things like swordfish and tuna are tagged. I mean, they know exactly how many tuna were caught last year, exactly how many swordfish were caught all over the world. And they catch, right now, uh, swords and tunas are coming from mostly South America, Sri Lanka. They come from all over the world. They catch these fish, they pack them in ice containers, they're on a jet, and they're in New York the next day. I mean, this stuff, this has become such a very specialized industry in that way that it, I can't tell you. I've seen the tuna you eat in Sapporo, Yosaku, any of these places probably came from my shop this morning because it is still that good at sushi grade. I mean, you can eat it raw. If you go in the store, we have it sushi grade. If you want to take it and just sear it for a second, eat it, you're fine. You can feel well, very safe. The metals in the fish? Do we have to worry about that? Well, you know, there's still talk and there's still talk about swordfish, you know, having, um, particularly swordfish, having enough heavy metals in it that it's only dangerous to like Pregnant women, I think, is the only one they target is a problem. Now, if you ate swordfish every day of your life, it'd probably be an issue. I mean, I think it's like anything else. If you ate steak every day of your life, you'd probably not do well. Um, but I think if you had swordfish once, a, once every week or two, uh, my feeling is it's not an issue. But I think it's the pregnant women that they say you should avoid. You know. Um, I think swordfish is the only one that comes under that category. I don't think tuna does anymore. How about worms and swordfish? They're there. Parasites. Um, they're there. Um, a swordfish, you can tell by the outside. They, it's, it's like any animal, I guess. I'm sure beef or hogs or anything else have the same issue when they slaughter them. And what we do is when we break down a swordfish, if we see a particular problem, we cut way around it and cut it out. And it's particularly, they're not little nematodes. They're usually a, a large entry uh, by something in the water. Who knows what? Um, Can you see them on a light table? The only thing we put over a light table basically are codfish. Cod um, particularly are the ones, because, of, because they're bottom feeders, that they're swimming amongst the seagrass a lot, and they will pick up nematodes or... or uh, or worms, if you will. So we do have to go through the cod particularly. Now, some people get really freaked out by it. Um, and I can understand why. No one wants to see something crawling around, you know. But um, they're pure protein. They yeah. won't bother you. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. It's a little some freaky, but... Yeah, it, it, but... Uh, you know, we have a rare case where someone will miss one, uh, but all cod go across a light table and they're inspected. Swordfish, same deal, um, particularly. We don't see pollock. I've never seen a, we call them nematodes. We never see a worm in a pollock. I've never seen one, ever. It never happened. Haddock, extremely rare. Um, hate only in the bellies, that's it. Um, never in the body of the fish, for some reason. Uh, cusk, you gotta be, you gotta put those across too. They can be because they bottom feeders uh, in the seaweed. Pick anything that sw swims in weeds, you know, seaweed and grasses tend to pick them up. It's like probably like, you know, like uh, ticks. I don't know. Yeah. Probably the same thing. What does one do with pollock? Um, most anything you can do with a haddock or cod. I mean, they're basically the same structure. Uh, they flake the same, they cook the same, and people object to it because it's a slightly darker color. But um, 
and it has a slightly different flavor. I mean, if you if you put a piece of Pollock, a haddock, and a cod on the table and blindfold yourself, you could tell the difference probably. Um, we're finding more and more people using Pollock, not you. <laughs> what, you don't want Pollock? No, no, no. Oh. I, I just, I can't tell how much Oh, really? Uh, probably a lot of people can. I mean, you, I could tell you several restaurants that use them like their fish tacos. They use nothing but Pollock. Uh, there are some pretty well-known restaurants in this town that are using Pollock and their chowders and some of their other things because it's a less expensive protein source. And it's good. Um, again, unless you, I, I do one dish. I don't think I put it in the cookbook. I used to do, early on, we didn't have much money. I used to take Pollock home and you'd slice it on a bias. Um, so you'd have these sort of silver dollar, big silver dollar pieces. And I used to do it like a piccata, where you would saute with lemon, and I would kind of stack it. looked very elegant. It cost me like 20 cents. You know, and you stack it like this on a plate, a little bit of lemon. And I mean, it's just fabulous. You just do it like a piccata dish. It's, it's great. Pollock piccata. Yeah, you know, quote, the underutilized species thing. Um, Pollock was considered that for years and years, and I think it's come off that chart now because it's so... I can't tell you how much Pollock was selling in the last couple of years versus some other things. That have... used to be fancy prisons too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, way back when, right? Yeah, yeah. not so much anymore. So the most prevalent fish that you're buying by weight? By you mean? popularity. Haddock. Haddock. Yeah, haddock still. Um, um, well, I don't catch much cod anymore. So I would have said cod, but they don't catch it much anymore. In terms of volume, it's probably Pollock. Uh, and Pollock because the restaurants are using it. Not so much that it's a consumer thing, but it's, it's more of a restaurant food service thing. Um, the, I mean, the stuff that we sell the most of is always, is always Haddock. Uh, Gulf of Maine-wise, it's Haddock. Um, we still sell a lot of flounder and graysole. You know, the flatfish, yeah. um, halibut, because that's still sort of a Gulf of Maine, even though most of it comes down out of uh, Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. it's still caught within the Gulf of Maine. Yeah, I mean, halibut's still probably the premier, uh, what I would call large fish. Um, but it depends what time of year. Halibut's extremely popular in the wintertime because it's sort of a baking fish. Mm -hmm where the tuna and swordfish sort of a grilling thing that, that you might do more in the summertime, you know? So, uh, it, some of this stuff is real seasonal as to what people want and buy. Like flounder in the wintertime is very popular because, you know, nine out of 10 times it's going in the stove uh, as opposed to on a grill. So, yeah. Um, so let's talk about, oh, I have handouts. Just because on, on the cod, the Noah thing, I just did it in case you can take them when you go, just to look at, see what it looks like. So I encourage people to use the Noah site if you are have any questions about, you know, should I or shouldn't I? Um, I find it a, a heck of a great resource. So one thing I did tonight, um, that I wanted to talk about was cooking fish. It's the other sort of question we get when it comes to cooking. I mean, to me... When it comes to meat, for example, you know, you got your steak, you got your pork, you got your lamb, and then you can do certain things with them. In the seafood business, I mean, although they're similar, but you have your pollock and you got your cod and your haddock and you got, you know, flounders and sole and you got swordfish and tuna. Yeah, I mean, you got salmon, you got uh, steelhead. See, I mean, you got choices all over the place. And they all can be done differently or they all can sort of be done the same. Um, and the nice thing about cooking with seafood, for me, is um, you can do something different every night. It's, it's a, and you can cook it differently. Like you can saute it uh, certain kinds easily, or you can bake certain kinds real easily, or you can uh, grill certain kinds. I mean, there's just lots of different ways. It's so versatile that, um, to me, it's the most versatile of the food groups that you can serve every night and entertain with. I mean, you can make it as elegant as you want or you can make it as simple as you want. I mean, you can take a piece of halibut like this, stick it in the oven, put a little lemon on it, and, you know, that's, that's a no-brainer. Or you can start doing some of the things we did in the cookbook and 
you know, 58 ingredients and go crazy and, you know, blow your dinner guests away and, you know, they'll be impressed, sort of. So, cooking seafood, and I get huge amounts of questions about how long do I cook it? Well, I don't know your stove. That's the biggest problem. You know, uh, some stoves are like, at 350, really is 350. And maybe they're 390. You know, you don't know. Everyone's different. So, you know, some people got a, a $200 electric range or a, you know, $8,000 one of these babies. So it's different for everybody. And the fish is different. A swordfish will cook very different than a, than a filet of sole or, or a gray sole. Very differently. Um, so how do you how do you know how long to cook anything? And that's the big question. And I've seen more people. Well, if it's this thick, you cook it for thirty seconds, and uh, you know this thick, and so we've got people with rulers and measuring tapes. And I got a simple one. I said, here's what you do: you take your fish, right? This is a piece of halibut, and you take this toothpick, right? Here, and you go like this. See what that feels like. You want to come on up and feel this. Come on up, and just sort of stick it in there. Yeah. Give it a shot. See what that feels like to you. Got the feel of that? Mm -hmm. I got another one. Can I try that. Okay. Got it? There's a particular feel, right? Like a resistance almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to stick this in the oven for a few minutes, and then we're going to do it again. Now this is really important with a thick fish like this. Now a, a real thin piece of haddock or sole, you know it's going to cook pretty quick. But it's the thick ones like this, people don't know what to do and how long. So, I don't know. We got a timer? Yeah. So, someone got five minutes? Let's do five minutes. Let's see what happens in five minutes. What are we at, 350? Yep. Okay. You got a timer? Yep. Oh, you're so good. All right. How many people can set their time for a long time? So, we're going to come back to it and, and kind of, we're going to test it in five minutes. Uh, so, I brought a couple of things, and you can, we can go anywhere with this at this point. I've kind of covered the topics I want to cover, and I'll take questions whenever. If I can answer them, I will. If I can't, I'll lie. So, um, I, brought, I brought a couple of squid, just so people are always fascinated by squid. And when they see them whole in the store, they don't know what to do. They love them when they go out and they get them fried. Yep. You know, fried calamari, oh boy. Yep. But if I got a live squid there, what the hell am I doing with that thing? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what my mother used to do. We used to take them home like this. And my favorite recipe was she would take the tube, we would clean it, she would take the tube and she would chop up the tentacles with a little bit of garlic and a little bit of breadcrumbs and, you know, a little bit of this and that, whatever magic she did. And she'd stuff it back into the into the tube and then she'd put a toothpick through it and she would take the wings off and that would be part of the, the chopping process and part of the she'd saute that all up a little white wine a little, you know what cooking is whatever looks good to you you don't need a cookbook the cookbook just sort of gives you ideas about okay I'm gonna make those stuffed mushrooms with crab but I'm gonna do it my way I'm gonna add a little this a little that you know so she did her thing she'd stuff them and then she would roast them and make spaghetti sauce on the side, right? So we would get these roasted stuffed squid on the table. My father was, he, my father used to, he used to go down to the docks when we were babies and kids, and he would lump boats, which means he would go down to the docks and help unload boats as a second job. You'd get paid money, and of course they paid you by, they'd give you five bucks, and then they would give you all the fish you wanted to take home. So he'd come home with squid, and he'd come home with gray sole, or whatever he had. And that's how we learned, growing up, how to do all this stuff, because, you know, most normal kids don't. So she would take the squid and bake them in the oven, pull them out, and they'd be nice and sort of crispy, and but sort of soft on the inside with that stuffing, and then spoon the tomato sauce over them. And we'd slice them like this, so they'd be in rounds with the stuffing in the middle. Pine nuts, you know, I mean, just like whole. So to me, that fried calamari is great, but if you want to try something, just get some whole squid one of these days. You can buy it frozen with the tubes and the tentacles, and that's what restaurants generally do. And go home and do it yourself. It's an easy, fun thing to do. 
but if you, do you want to do you want to see how to yeah. clean one? Yeah. Okay. okay. So these came in uh, yesterday. These are from Casco Bay, by the way, from a fishing boat called the Deja Vu. Uh, Danny Harriman, captain, and he brought these in with a bunch of mackerel. So you can come on up and come around. And we'll kind of play with them. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. I don't know. My friend's got one and put it next to the So a squid is actually a cephalopod, better known as shellfish. It's in the clam family. It's not in the fish family. Um, it does have a vertebra that runs right through here. And that ink is extremely prized uh, to make black squid ink pasta, if you've ever eaten that. Yeah, if you can get a hold of that stuff, it's real good. So I'm going to do one. Um, I'm going to do one like this. We'll start with, no, I'll, do it the, I'll do it the way I would normally do it. So I'm going to reach in, even though that's all that ink. And I'm going to pull the guts. Is that five minutes? That's two minutes. That's two minutes to go. One oh. minute left. On this one. Oh. Well, this one bloated with ink. That is its oh. backbone. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it looks like a quill. Wow. Or, yeah. And it's it's like cellulose. They're pretty oh. wild, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. I know. It's cartilage, but it yeah. looks like cellulose. Yeah. So. All right. I pull, I'm going to rinse this. Here, here, yeah. So we have got ink all over the one. It is, uh, it will stain too, like ink. I'll tell you a family story. We were in a restaurant in New York City. I won't tell you who was involved, but I will just tell you it's a family story. And two of the <laughs> people, <laughs> two, of the, two of the people, this restaurant didn't obviously know what they were doing. They, they did not. They had black squinting pasta with shellfish, you know, mussels and clams and all this other good stuff. And two of the people are eating the squidding pasta. I was eating something else. Were you there? I was there. You were there. You were eating something else. <laughs> so all of a sudden I look up and I look over and I look over and I go, what the hell is that? Their teeth were totally black. Their oh, mouth no. was black. If you do this right, My that sister. never happens. It was her sister <laughs> and her. I mean black oh, like no. you took this and just washed your mouth. Off. Okay, let's play no, with I this. Can't. No, this could be hot. Yeah, this, this is hot. Yeah, so... Uh, all right, let's try this. Let's try this again. Don't anyone touch the dish. Go ahead and poke it and tell me how, what you feel. Pretty raw inside. You feel that? Yeah. Well, that's what you should feel. It's only been five minutes, right? So we've got our tube, we've got our, quote, wings, we're going to just pull them off. Here's what happens. See how that skin peels right off? Wow. Nice piece of white meat right there. I'm going to do it again on this side. Again, nice piece of white meat. Then you take the tube. And again, I'm just going to peel this. Sometimes it helps out fingernails. And you do this. Oh. Now, in the Asian community, you would not peel this. You would leave the skin on. Because that skin imparts a huge amount of flavor. All right, now this is your tube. I would then take this and rinse it and clean it out, kind of squeeze it and get everything out of there. But that's your basic tube. If you are going to stuff that, you would leave it just like that. Okay? Then, a squid has two eyes, and it then has a mouth that is, let's see if I can squeeze it out of there, it's actually a beak. It looks like, Ooh. It, it, it's hard, almost like a, a bird's beak, and I can't quite get it open, but if you can see that, yeah. It's, yeah. it's actually a little beak right there. Yeah. That's its mouth and how it feeds. 
So I'm going to snip it right there and pull the beak out. And then oh what you do goodness. under running water is sort of take your thumb because you want all these little tentacle cups that a squid uses okay. to grab and, and, and suction cups, if you will, and kind of just get those off as best you can. A few went, aren't going to hurt anything. So you do that, and then I take the whole process and I'm going to rinse it again. I'm just going to say no. It's a riot. So, you can do a couple of things. You can cut this into rings. Bing, 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 bing. You can make a spaghetti sauce if you want. Or I'll show you a real quick sauce that I'll just explain it to you because it's simple. So, you can, you can cut that in half. I would leave that whole. If you got a you got a saute pan, olive oil, garlic, pull your garlic out. Take your squid that you've cut up, throw it in there, let it simmer, maybe ten minutes. Parsley, salt, pepper. You can use Paul Newman's spaghetti sauce. It doesn't matter because this is going to flavor that. You don't really need some exotic homemade spaghetti sauce that you've been working on for two days. You put it in there and just let it simmer for maybe fifteen minutes, and you scoop that over some linguine. You want to die. I mean, I'm serious. It is good. And it's simple. So that's how you clean one. So don't be afraid. If you see this, don't let it scare you. Take it home because it's 10 times better than the frozen thing you're going to buy. Wow. Guaranteed. So, and you throw this away. Sorry about all the ink. I didn't expect that's that. Right. Yeah. So, what are, so those, what are those guys? What's the price point for this? Like, these? Yeah. $4.99? Something like that? Yeah. Definitely for yeah, it's something to do, yeah. you know. It's just something to do. So that's it. You've got your tentacles. Again, if you were going to stuff them, you chop that up, you chop this all up, you saute it yeah. like you would any ground up anything. You know, add your little bit of stuffing and your parsley and your, and your garlic or whatever and put it back in there. In here. You can cook it in spaghetti sauce too, right? You can cook it in spaghetti sauce. I kind of like them sauteed right in a pan. You just kind of do that sort of thing, you know. And, and then you've got a stuffed squid. Yeah, it's elegant. I mean, you blow people away doing that. They kind of go, what are you doing, you know? But, yeah, it's cool, right? So, can I use that? Yeah. Really? I'm going to kick it out every day. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes twice a day. Sometimes. All right, so that's a squid. That's what I thought of it. Because most people don't get to see that. I mean, that's kind yeah. of a... I would never have attempted that. No. No. no? But you see how easy it was? I mean, that was not... Yeah, it was. That really was not hard. You know, I mean, Fair it you know, messy, stuff. obviously. Right. Sorry about that. That's all right. So just get them out of your way if you're right. open up some oysters. Yeah, we're gonna do some oysters just to play with them, just to play with something here. I'll just leave that all right there. But look how white that meat is. Yeah. I mean, it's just beautiful. You clean it. I mean, you want you clean it up a little bit. But. We should cook it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Got some garlic. Yeah. Yes, we do. Squid. When I first met them, I was a teenager, and I thought it was crazy food. You know, I just thought they ate like crazy people because we never ate anything that even we didn't even have garlic. So I thought I'd never. And it's I would rather have that than lobster and lobsters. I would. It's unbelievable. A stuffed one is really good. Over pasta is the best. I know. Alright, let's get that off. Look, Susie said she'd cook them just for the heck of them. Just so you can taste them. Yippee! Here, do you want to use this so you don't want to wet Yeah. I had no idea. Alright, so what are we, 10 minutes now? Yep. 10 minutes with a what? 2 inch slash down to half an inch? Alright, stab it again, but again, be careful that it's hot. Stab the look down. Yeah, it's, it's but do you see you see what by doing with the toothpick how you can yeah. tell? Can you feel the resistance? Yeah. Are you feeling any resistance in there? Yeah, a lot or a little. A lot. It's, it's like when you're swimming in the lake yeah. and there's there's the yeah. surface temperature and then you get that extra like six feet down. Yeah. Is that all of a sudden it's colder? Oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's the same thing. It's like you push in so and suddenly it's tough. No, so we're but probably cooked down here. Yeah. 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 But not, not so much, so much up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. more up there. Yeah. 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 All right. Another five. Anyone else? Yeah. I would do less than that. 
You want to do less? Yeah. How about three minutes? I say three. <laughs> three minutes. Let's see if you're right. It smells good, though. <laughs> All right, let's clean this other one real quick. I'm going to do this over here. I know it sounds bizarre, but try it. It does work. With the skins on, you with the skins it on, yeah. And shake it? Put it in, a, in, a, in just a dry pot, yeah. And then shake it really hard, and for 10, 15 seconds, and then you open it up. So the, nice. the garlic will be separated from the skin. Wow. Oh yeah, right. And the pot's empty. Yeah, and you're just using it just to make. No kidding. Yeah, and it really does work. Works every time. That's wild. Is it spicy? Well, that's good. Uh, is what? A little, um, cartilage? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so bad. Wow. I use it so much. Yeah, yeah. It tastes really, yeah, it does. Wow. I know, doesn't it? That was the cartilage. Yes, at the back. Sure. Wow, it matter is that good? I would think this would be something you'd come up with. It does. It feels like it's a cosmetic case. Oh, there's this little mouth. Wow. This thing's loaded with egg. It's incredible. Yeah. So you threw away the beak, and now you're the only thing to You won't need the pasta. <laughs> That's why they call it a. This is why I take photographs. You ready? ready? I know I did something. <laughs> you don't even need to get too crazy cleaning this. This is probably good. Just the garlic smells. I know. Oh, yeah. Always. Yeah. Nothing as long as there are no eyeballs in there. Nope, we got rid of all of those. <laughs> How's that three minutes? <laughs> oh, I think. Did that go off? Four seconds. It didn't go off. Uh, no? Two seconds. One. Well, that's, that's the clock in the man's head right there. Uh, 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 really? All right. I think you're right. I think we're there, but I think you need to feel it. Because, it, and here's the other side of this. I say it's Sitting in this hot dish, that is going to continue to cook. With fish in particular, you can leave it in that hot dish, and if you put it back in the oven for another three minutes, you've overdone it. Oh. You're there. You see. I'm gonna try it. Oh no, we're there. Be careful, I get squidding. <laughs> yeah. Now, how long does this cook for? Uh, when it goes like all white and away from translucent, you're pretty much there. Right? You keep. I keep on a little while though. <laughs> So then you put that in the sauce? No, you just add, you you just add ladle right some... Right in there. Right you could add a little white wine yeah. if you wanted to. Yeah. And then just ladle some sauce on there. Yeah. Mm, right out of a jar. Baby. doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah. White wine. I've got white wine. And you can eat just like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We got plenty yeah. downstairs. It's what I... Wherever they have it, wherever we go, I always order it. Wow. And we have it at home. Oh, and I I'm making this for guests. It's just unreal. I know. They'll be so impressed. They will be. It'll be hard. Which is something I find. It'll be. It'll be hard not to lecture. That's right. That was so good. You know, 
Oh, no, yeah, I'm starting with yeah, this. Yeah, you know, parsley, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. parsley <laughs> salt, pepper, a little white wine. Yeah. Out of the yeah. sauce <laughs> here. Um, you could do this right over linguine the way it is, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. It's close. A few pieces want to go a little more. I think you're there. No, I'm not going to ask you to open it. <laughs> <laughs> My liability Jennifer insurance is not that good. <laughs> I, I ended up seriously injured with getting an opportunity. Yes, you can. you got to be very careful. Yeah. But we're going to show you a safer way to do it. Well, let this cool a little bit before you guys taste. Okay, so we have the oysters of the rage. They are now the rage. You look around Portland in particular, there's oyster bars, there's new ones opening, there's world famous ones now here in Portland. Um, and they buy 90% of their stock from us. Um, these happen to be Norham Vegas. Norham Vegas are from the Damascotta River. They're a bottom grown oyster. Um, and then I'm going to give you a website and we're going to look at it. Thank you very much for that. So what's um, going to happen to the oysters once you open them? We're well, probably going to eat them. Yes. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. Okay. You see that little baby? Out, this is mandatory. This, glove. this glove. This is what my fish cutters use. It has a special sort of um, I need that for avocados. <laughs> <laughs> that too. But, I mean, I would really, I would really have to go at it to go through this. I used a curved tip, okay? There are some oyster knives that are very sharp. They come to a real point. They scare the heck out of me. And, and I can open a fair amount of oysters, and I don't use those. What I like about this is it creates leverage. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, an oyster is protected by one little abductor muscle in there. That's what keeps it closed. And you get to that and you open the oyster, all right? Glove, some sort of cloth like this that you can set it down so that never hold it this way, always this way. So your fingers are away and your palm is right here. And then I go after the hinge right here. Now, of course, I'm not gonna have any luck, but as you give it pressure, and you keep turning. You have to really want to eat an oyster. And I'm going to have a hard time. Of course. It's a class. But, okay, that slipped. Did you see that? Yeah. yeah. That slipped. But where did it go? Into the oyster, right. not in my hand. Right. All right? So that's that's important. Yeah, it's very important. <laughs> very important. Statement of the year. So, all right, we've cut the muscle away. And that's it. Wow. We've got a juicy oyster from the Damerscotta River. Who wants one first? <laughs> I don't have any lemon or anything. You're going to have to go cold turkey. No mignettes, no lemons. Mm. It's not, it's, it's alive right now, but the sushi cuts it. Yeah, now see this one, I leveraged open. See that? See that? See how that, the, that tip leveraged that thing? Enough for me to open it. Cut the muscle right there. Down she goes. It's almost like It is. Damascotta River oysters. Um, I've eaten oysters in a lot of different places. Not so much in Europe, but in the United States. There's nothing that can touch a Damascotta River oyster. Nothing. Who else? <laughs> they are. I've never, I have never eaten. An oyster raw. Oh, really? They're really good. They're much better. You need lemon? Yeah, lemon will do the trick. 
I wish I liked them. Bro, that is really good. I, mean, like, I love the Damaris Cottons. They're my favorite. You have to make them. Yeah, we should. We definitely should. We should really try it. The only other should. thing I ever said no to was, was Haggis. Ooh! Yeah, that's yeah, that's that was bad. bad. Oh, that's yeah. And it was like, that was like, I couldn't. That was after an air flight, too. So it was just, oh. Like you needed another reason to not have Haggis. Right. My husband did it, though. Ooh, a big oh pool. my god, that's, that's not how you start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a monster. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I don't know, I might eat this one. That eat is it, yeah. yeah. That's yours. That was yours. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah. Next. Not yet. No one? You gonna do it? Just that down is, it. Don't even yeah. think about it. Yeah. This is a jumbo. Woo! Is it? You should try it. That was a good one. Now, really? yeah. Yeah. So, now they judge oysters by several things. Um, how deep the cup is. That's the cup. Mm -hmm. How deep is it? Real shallow, probably not as good an oyster. Deep cup oyster is preferred. Um, like I said, these oysters all come from the same seed. So it depends where they grow. In this case, the part of the Damascata River, these are in the upper part of the river. The salinity is fairly low in the upper part. The lower part, it's higher, as you would imagine, yeah. uh, from, from, the, from the tides. Um, Different parts of the river produce different salinity oysters. I find these a little less, and I find like the Glidden Points, for example, uh, with more salinity of salt. And, and the flavors vary. Um, if you taste oysters from everywhere, they, they taste different. Some are, there's an oyster site. Uh, you know what? I'll open a few more, don't worry. <laughs> I can see you ogling. So there's an oyster site. Um, if I can get to it real quick. It's called the oysterguide.com and um, let's go look at it and see what he says about Norman Vegas. The Oyster Guide. Now this site is written by, um, uh, his name is Rowan Jacobson. He's a pretty cool guy. Um, you can do a bunch of things on his site, but I'm going to go to Oyster Finder. So, he has every virtual oyster that there is, and I think he has Norumbegas, I hope, I hope. Uh, Norumbega, right there. I'm going to click on that. I think it might be. Okay, is it Norumbega? Yeah, it keeps, keeps scrolling. Let's see it. Oh, there it is, Norumbega. Uh, winter points, which we carry. Glidden points we carry, Norm Vegas we carry, Pemmicwoods we carry, Dodge Coves we carry, Flying points we carry, Wiley points, Taunton Bay. They have a different flavor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what he says about this oyster, just to compare what you just ate, uh, a newcomer to the main oyster scene, though grow, grower, Eric Peters, is no newbie when it comes to aquaculture. He's been doing it for many years, which he has, and it shows in his Norm Vega. The salinity, um, Oh, I'm sorry. He's, which had the perfect yin shape and deep, smooth cup every oyster girl dreams about. And that's what he means by a nice, smooth cup mm. right there. Uh, the salinity of the Norumbega is surprisingly light for a Damascata oyster. The flavor intriguingly tangy. A good choice for those who prefer a milder oyster. That's because they're grown up river, uh, up river a little further. Um, for example, if we read the Glidden Point, um, it says... Just real quickly, like most Damascata oysters, Glidden Points are always light and clean and flavored. Watery, translucent, uh, slow growth, because they're, they're grown in 40 feet of water, which is very deep for an oyster. So, uh, a good site, um, an oyster guide, real simple, if you are into oysters. Is that on the handout? Um, you know what, I don't know if I What's wrote it on there. Oyster guide. oyster guide, pretty simple. You could Google oyster guide. It's just oyster yeah. guide. No, I just had I did cod and salmon from Noah. I didn't okay. write that down. Sorry. Okay. Write it down. Uh, How about the squid? What do you think? Oh, oh very good. Good. Is it good? You can try that. Different than fried calamari, right? Yes. Yeah. Can we oh, taste yeah. this? Yeah. yeah, sure. I don't care. Use your fork and dig in. Oops. 
see how it looks in there. Oh, it's perfect, really. So that's how it should be in the middle? Oh, yeah. Moist. Yeah. Moist. Yeah, most, Moist. Most people would cook fish. That's and to me, to me, fish is all about see, moisture. I would think that wasn't cooked. I would, too. Yeah, yeah it wasn't yeah. a color. Yeah. You want that pink? Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> the toothpick test. I'm not sure about that. Everyone wants them. They are so delicious. Try one. No, no. Because <laughs> if I start to gag, that mm. would be you want some fish? Close your eyes. Just close your eyes and the trick. The trick. The, I was. I was. I, I was an adult when I first yeah. tried it. And the trick is just don't chew. Just yeah, don't chew. Just swallow. Just swallow. You're just well, swallowing it. Why you like taste oh, the, the it? taste oh, is everything. Uh, yeah. taste. Let, let, do this. Like take it. Take the oyster and just sip the liquid. Yeah. Don't eat the oyster. Yeah, just, just sip the liquid. All right. All right. I'll just do sip that. it. Yeah, do that. So, what do you think of that? Good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. Okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> when my daughter was, was ten years old, she tried one because she didn't know what it was, and I was having some. She ate probably about eighteen minutes. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> and it was only afterwards she turned to her mother and said, uh, "Well, this is good. How come you don't eat it, Mom?" And her mother said, "Well, any, anything that's that close to being alive." She says. What do you mean? You know, oh. and then she never had one for 20 years after that. Then she finally got over the fact it was all mental. Oh, well, I know that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I have a neighbor who lives down the street from me who is has a journal. He's close. He has a journal. <laughs> <Your lips touched laughs> it. He has a journal of every oyster he's ever oh, eaten. If you, no. would, if you would feel more comfortable, you describes it. After <laughs> <I tried. laughs> Did she do it yet? No, no. no. We're gonna ready. hold her down. Ready. No, 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 thank no. you. I know, I know. <laughs> my daughter will be stuck. My daughter. Will be. You want us? You want us to film it and we can send no, it to no, you? She's in. It's already being broadcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Please. Here it goes. Go. 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 Okay, I did it. <laughs> 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 need well, something to drink real quick? <laughs> 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 but it's very good. I eat steamers by hand, uh, candlelight. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you should try. It is so good. You have never had one? Oh. Another one more. The key, the key for me is lemon. Mm -hmm. I have to. I'm with, I'm it does help with lemon. I do it with lemon. Yeah, I do with lemon. I didn't bring one. Like just, just squeeze right into it. And then. Well, the real yeah. oyster thing now is mignettes or whatever they put. They make these little champagne yeah. flavored yeah. something or others. And cocktail sauce is still popular, though I don't particularly like it. Yeah, but. no, but then you hide the. Pro the exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas lemon would bring it out. I like a little touch of course. At Elsevier Barbecue out yeah. in South Portland, they do grilled oysters, and they're they're still very tender. They're very yeah, they, they like, virtually just this? yeah. You just Elsevier and, the and they do it with right garlic yeah, butter. Yeah, doesn't take much. Oh my God, Elsevier, Elsevier, Elsevier. Yeah, yeah. Like barbecue uh, place. Barbecue uh, place on Cottage yeah. Road. I, I go to the Cajun Festival in Lafayette, Louisiana, yeah. every year, and uh, you know you can get a whole. Of them, you know, maybe 50 of them for $10. Yeah, they're, know, they're all little guys. Little, little ones, ones, yeah. Don't and do what, she, do what she did. Just taste the liquor. Just sip it. Do that first. It helps. <laughs> it helps. Well, I, I went on my honeymoon. We went to Arcachon in France, and it's the oyster capital oh, really? of France. Is and it? everybody's eating oysters, so I felt really out of it. I really should. You could do it. It's like having a little salt water in the ocean. No, Only it's got more. It's better. Yeah. Is she going? She's going to do it. She's going to do it. She's thinking about it. You can do it. If you I don't, can do it, you don't, you it. You don't have to do it. Or you could or do it. it. Yes! Did you chew? Ooh. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm not the only one. That's a good one. Yeah. The flavor of it. Okay. It's like the ocean. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the point. Yeah. And, and people who are really into them, you know, they sample different ones and say, "Oh, I really like that." And, you, know, you know, I like them real salty, or they're really. It's sort of like wine, I suppose. You know, you yeah. get different yeah. flavors that you it's like. It's better than wine. <laughs> it depends. Wine with the oysters is a nice combination. Would anybody else like some fish? Thank you. Didn't get any. I took a taste. Okay. Good for you. Want another one? Yeah, let's go. I'll take one. 
one more maybe. Really? Okay. Wow. All right. Doesn't take much. She's in. That's right. That's right. Well, that, when you ask, you can do that again. Yes. Well, you, I only did it because you did it because I just really like it. But you I can't believe how many it. times my daughter has said, Mom, I cannot believe you're not. You've eaten fried grains. How come you can't eat this? Because <laughs> it was dead. <laughs> my mother, this is a true story. My mother passed away this past January, and I think it was in November, she was over at the house, right? So I brought home, I'm thinking, three dozen oysters, right? And she, what she really likes are clams, which I actually brought a couple. <clears throat> um, hard shell clams. So <clears throat> I put the plate of oysters out on the table for all of us to eat. True story, right? <laughs> So I'm cooking away and da, 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 drinking some wine and all that, and Kathleen's over there. I turn around, they were gone. <gasps> she didn't say, Did, would anyone like one? <laughs> maybe she knew it was her last Oyster Fest for a feed for the rest of her life. You probably, maybe she knew that. I don't know. But she killed it, all of them. I said, oh, my God, Mom. Three dozen? How about saving one or two? <gasps> oh, I'm sorry, she said. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Whoa. I'll have to email my daughter. Someone's into them now. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any more? Oh, well, I got it going. You want to know your safe? No, I'm going to. Really? Okay. I was going to say, I'll take one. Well, I'm going to see how you do that because at one point, I always have trouble with this. Well, it is the hard part. Yeah. Oh. And they get, so some of them you get brittle. You know, you got to be a little careful. Yeah, I've actually had to use a hammer before. Well, I'll tell you another good yeah. device, believe it or not, <laughs> yeah. is a screwdriver, a flathead screwdriver. Oh, sort okay. of do the same thing. Yeah. All right. You can uh -huh. get into the hinge and you can yeah, kind of work it. One, you yeah, know? be easier. Uh -huh. There you go. Yeah, right at the joint. Uh -huh. We do sell the cut-resistant gloves. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. yeah. As do we. I mean, they're, they're, they're an integral okay. part of doing this. And the oyster knives. Mm -hmm. Who wants anybody? I'll take it. Oh, I'll take it. Oh, there you go. Oh, you Good. take it. No, no, no. no, no. Go ahead, Susie. Susie. No. You've done some work. Yeah. Really? <laughs> oh, what time is it over there? This is just how well, it is. Well, now we came up with a reason. Absolutely. She's in Watching this on TV. <laughs> <laughs> because he just texted you should have filmed it. Oh, no. He did? He said, How were the oysters? Oh! <laughs> and he said, I ate an oyster. Come down. Two actually. He goes, I saw. Oh my god! Oh, 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 very funny. Oh, that's a riot. Oh, you're here. <laughs> oh, that's him. <laughs> that's him. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Right. That is very funny. Oh, that's funny. I said, someone's watching this? Yeah. <laughs> hey. There's one there. No, she texted me this morning. They never loaded any of the luggage on her flight, so no one on the flight got the luggage. That is a nightmare. No, I will she said, thank you, Mom, for always teaching me to be bring an extra pair of underwear and an outfit in my carry-on. Yeah. Here, you can put your oyster shells in here. Thank you. And there's some left for anyone. I think that's... Sure. I just mailed a friend with my sister's bunch of shells. Because? What? Well, she's going to cancel it. She's going to cancel it to me. Because she'll be able to fix you. I have one that does not want to open. This was a great class. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, yes. If you want to hand me the plates, I'll make some room here. Does she want more? Do you want these shells? Sure. Do you? And so. And there's two more oysters on a half shell for someone to eat. Don't throw them away. Yeah, don't wait. Oh, thank you very much. This is a lot. Well, I'm not bad. Two more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 